discuss two views of faith. This is a cooperative effort to further education of their respective beliefs. I ask for your cooperation as fellow students to respect the views presented and the rights of the individuals. This afternoon, we will be debating the topic of the concept of God in Islam and Christianity. Our two debaters are Mr. Shabir Ali, who is on his way in. Mr. Ali is married with four children. He has a BA in Religious Studies from Laurentian University. He is also the president and founder of the Islamic Information and Dawa Center, Toronto. He is mostly self-taught in the area of comparative religions. Our other debater will be Dr. William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig is a research professor of philosophy at the Talbot School of Theology in La Mirada, California. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his wife Jan and their two children. Dr. Craig pursued his undergraduate studies at Wheaton College, a BA in 1971, graduate studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, studied at the University of Birmingham in England for his PhD, and the University of Munich, Germany for his D theology. From 1980 to 1986, he taught philosophy of religion at Trinity, during which time he and Jan started their family. I'd like to thank Campus Crusade for Christ and McMaster, as well as the Islamic Information Center and Dawa Center International for hosting this event. I'd also like to thank Sam and Eddie, who will be moderating this debate. The flow of this afternoon will be as follows. The two sides will debate, as explained by our moderator. This will be followed by a 20-minute question and answer period. Before we begin, I would like to draw your attention to the information cards under your seats, if you have them. If you don't have them with you, could you raise your hands so somebody can get one to you? We just get some people to bring those back. We'd like to have an indicator of your thoughts on this topic and this debate before and after we, uh, we do it. So if you just take a moment now to answer some of the questions. And uh, when the debate begins, at the conclusion of the debate, we'll ask for the rest of your opinion. Now I'm going to pass things over to Sam. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Well, I certainly have a tall order today. Um, hope you appreciate the position that I'm in. My role today is simply to moderate, and I want to make that very clearly clear. I also want to add that this is not uh, an MSU event, so the opinions expressed here are not those of the MSU. I want you to keep in mind that the participants have mutually agreed to the format and procedure, so there could be some concern with as to, to why this format. It was determined uh, before we came along, and it was, as I said, mutually agreed upon between uh, two debaters, the format, the style, and the procedures. Keep in mind, and please insert the word editorial here, uh, I believe this should be a discussion. Uh, regardless of, of the nomenclature, you know, uh, I know there's been various uh, words used, debate, discussion. I interpret it as you will. Uh, it may be uh, contentious at times, but respect should prevail during the discussion today. To the eye, this may seem like a confrontation, and, and the way it's set out uh, might lead you to think that way, but um, despite the setting, there's no clear winner today after uh, this debate, in my opinion. I don't know exactly what is, uh, is on your, your seats for evaluations, but in terms of my role as moderator in the MSU, there's no clear winner today. I would encourage you to learn about all the faiths that are at McMaster and beyond. Uh, I would encourage future forums to have more than just two participants that would have other you know, uh, faiths represented as well. But because this was mutually decided upon between the two debaters, we must respect their decision. As I said, there are many faiths and beliefs that are not presented here today, and as this is an institution of higher learning, I would encourage all of you to, as you wish, to become more well-versed and, and learn others as well, so that you can respect other viewpoints and have an appreciation for them. Um, I appreciate the document that was handed out uh, by the groups that were outside today. I would encourage future forums, as I said, to have as many participants as possible uh, besides just two. So, as moderator today, I've been asked to keep questions very clear. Uh, because we are discussing God and the concept of faith, it's not a very clear cut and dry discussion and debate, so uh, I would hope that the questions are uh, framed uh, as clearly as possible. 
that we do not uh, make references to any extraneous events that are not relevant to the debate today, uh, in our world today. So if, if people do stray uh, from that format, regardless of whatever, uh, whatever part of the room the question is coming from, I'll have to find that out of order. Um, so that's that's my role today, and uh, I have no opinion today as well. So welcome. All right, I'm gonna pass things on to start off, Dr. Lamb. I didn't know we were so politically incorrect. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be here today and uh, glad that you've come to uh, participate in the dialogue and debate today. It's been my prayer that throughout this week of uh, debates that God would guide us all in our spiritual journeys and that today's event might be a significant step forward for you in that journey. Now, in today's uh, debate, I'm going to defend two basic contentions. Number one that the Christian concept of God is rationally unobjectionable. And secondly, that the Muslim concept of God is rationally objectionable. So let's look at my first main contention, that the Christian concept of God is rationally unobjectionable. Christians believe that God is an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-holy, eternal, spiritual being who created the universe. Muslims agree with all of these attributes or properties of God. This isn't really surprising since Islam, historically speaking, is an offshoot of the Judeo-Christian religious tradition. And so our understanding of what God is like is in many respects the same. But the major objection lodged by Islam against the Christian concept of God concerns the doctrine of the Trinity. In particular, Christians believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and shares the same divine nature with God the Father. Muslims reject this doctrine because they believe that it commits the sin they call shirk, which is the sin of associating anything with God. Since God is thought to be incomparable or without peer, he cannot have a son as Christians claim. And thus the Quran denounces anyone who holds that God has a son as an unbeliever and consigns him to hellfire for such an assertion. The Quran states, they are unbelievers who say God is the Messiah, Mary's son. Surely whoever associates anything with God, God shall prohibit him entrance to paradise and his home shall be the fire. None shall help the evildoers. Surah 573. Unfortunately, the Quran's denunciation of the doctrine of the Trinity seems to be based upon a clear misunderstanding of that doctrine. First, a bit of history here. Early Christian creeds had adopted the language of speaking of Mary as the mother of God because she bore Jesus Christ. Now, to someone not familiar with the theology of the early church fathers, such an expression as the mother of God is guaranteed to be misleading. What the church fathers meant is that Mary bore Christ in his human nature, not his divine nature. Nevertheless, Mary could be called the mother of God since Christ was not only human, but also divine. But Muhammad evidently thought that Christians believed in a trinity composed of God the Father, Mary, and their offspring, Jesus. It's no wonder that he rejected such a ridiculous doctrine as blasphemous. Muhammad's misunderstanding of the trinity is evident in passages such as the following found in the Quran. God will say, Jesus, son of Mary, did you ever say to mankind, Worship me and my mother as gods, besides God? Glory be to you, he will answer. I could never have claimed what I have no right to. Or again it says, The creator of the heavens and the earth, how should he have a son, seeing that he has no consort, and he created all things? 
The doctrine that Muhammad rejected, namely that God the Father should consort with a human female to sire a son, and these three should then be worshipped as gods, would be rejected by any Christian. According to the Bible, Jesus is called God's son because he had no human father, but was miraculously conceived of a virgin. In the Gospel according to Luke, the angel says to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and God's power will rest upon you. For this reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. What makes this ironic is that the Kagan affirms the virgin birth of Jesus. In the Kaganic account, the angel says, I am but a messenger of your Lord and have come to give you a holy son. Mary answers, How shall I bear a son when I have neither been touched by any man nor ever been unchaste? The angel replies, Thus did your Lord speak. That is easy enough for me. Our decree shall come to pass. Whereupon Mary conceives Jesus. Thus no Muslim can object to calling Jesus God's son in the sense of his being miraculously conceived. So, if the doctrine of the Trinity is not the caricature rightly rejected by Muhammad, what is it? It is the doctrine that God is tri-personal. It is not the self-contradictory assertion that three gods are one God, nor again that three persons are one person. That's just illogical nonsense. Rather, it is the claim that the one entity we call God comprises three persons. That is no more illogical than saying one geometrical figure we call a triangle is comprised of three angles. Three angles in one figure. Three persons in one being. Perhaps the best way to think of this is to say that in God there are three centers of self-consciousness. I am a being with a single center of self-consciousness. God is a being with three centers of self-consciousness. Each of these three persons is equal in glory and divinity, but we call them Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because of the different roles they play in relation to us. The Father is the person who sends the Son to earth. The Son is the person who takes a human nature and becomes incarnate as Jesus of Nazareth. The Holy Spirit is the person who stands in Christ's place until Christ returns. Now, all this doctrine may seem strange to those of you who are Muslims, I think you've got to admit that once it's properly stated, there is nothing rationally objectionable about it. It is a logically consistent doctrine and seems rationally unobjectionable. In fact, I'd like to finish out my first contention by offering an argument for why I think it's plausible to think that God is a trinity. To begin with, God is by definition the greatest conceivable being. If you could think of anything greater than God, then that would be God. Now, as the greatest conceivable being, God must be perfect. If there were any imperfection in God, then he would not be the greatest conceivable being. Now, a perfect being must be a loving being, for love is a moral perfection. It is better for a person to be loving than unloving. God, therefore, must be a perfectly loving being. Now, it is of the very nature of love to give oneself away. Love reaches out to another person rather than centering wholly in oneself. So if God is perfectly loving by his very nature, he must be giving himself in love to another. But who is that other? It cannot be any created person, since creation is the result of God's free will, not a result of his nature. 
It belongs to God's very essence to love, but it does not belong to His essence to create. God is necessarily loving, but He is not necessarily creating. So we can imagine a possible world in which God is perfectly loving, and yet no created persons exist. So created persons cannot be the sufficient explanation of whom God loves. Moreover, we know from science that created persons have not always existed from eternity. But God is eternally loving. So again, created persons alone are not sufficient to explain who the other is to whom God's love is necessarily directed. It follows, therefore, that that other to whom God's love is necessarily directed must be internal to God himself. In other words, God is not a single, isolated individual, as Islam holds. Rather, God is a plurality of persons, as the Christian doctrine of the Trinity holds. On the Islamic view, God is not a, a, a triad of persons. He is a single person who does not give himself away in love, essentially, to another. He is focused essentially only upon himself, and hence he cannot be the most perfect being. But on the Christian view, God is a triad of persons in eternal, self-giving love relationships. Thus, since God is essentially loving, the doctrine of the Trinity is more plausible than any Unitarian doctrine of God, such as Islam. Why? Because God is by nature a perfect being of self-giving love. In summary of my first contention then, we've seen that the classical Muslim rejection of the Christian concept of God is based upon a drastic misunderstanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. And that once that doctrine is properly understood, it is not only rationally unobjectionable, but quite plausible as well. And therefore we can conclude my first contention that the Christian concept of God is rationally unobjectionable. But that brings us to my second contention, that the Muslim concept of God is rationally objectionable. Now, in claiming this, I'm not trying to put anybody down or attack someone personally. I'm just saying that it seems to me that the Islamic conception of God has real problems which render it rationally objectionable. Let me share just one of those deficits. Namely, Islam has a morally deficient concept of God. We've seen that Muslims and Christians agree that God is by definition the greatest conceivable being and that besides being all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, and so forth, the greatest conceivable being must also be morally perfect. That means that God must be a loving and gracious being. Therefore, God, as the perfect being, must be all-loving. And this is exactly what the Bible affirms. The Bible says, God is love. In this is love. Not that we loved God but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the sacrifice for our sins. Or again it says, God shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus taught God's unconditional love for sinners. We see this in His parables about the prodigal son and the lost sheep, in His practice of table fellowship with the immoral and unclean, and in his sayings, like those of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, for example, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the pagans do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. The love of the Heavenly Father, then, is universal, impartial, and unconditional. What a contrast with the God of the Quran. According to the Quran, God does not love sinners. 
This fact is emphasized repeatedly and consistently like a drumbeat throughout the pages of the Quran. Just listen to the following passages drawn from random surahs. God loves not the unbelievers. God loves not the impious and sinners. God loves not the evildoers. God loves not the proud. God loves not transgressors. God loves not the prodigal. God loves not the treacherous. God is an enemy to unbelievers. Over and over again, the Quran declares that God does not love the very people that the Bible says God loves so much that he sent his only son to die for them. Now this may seem paradoxical in light of the Quran's calling God, Al-Rahman uh, uh, al Al-Kahim, the all-compassionate, the all-merciful, until you realize that according to the Quran, what God's mercy really cashes out to is that if you believe and do righteous deeds, then God can be counted on to overlook your sins and reward your good works. And thus the Quran promises, work and God will surely see your work. Every soul shall be paid in full for what it has earned. Those who believe and do deeds of righteousness and perform the prayer and pay the alms, their wage awaits them with the Lord. <coughs> According to the Quran, God's love is thus reserved only for those who earn it. It says to those who believe and do righteousness, God will assign love. So the Quran assures us of God's love for the God-fearing and the good doers, but he has no love for sinners and unbelievers. Thus, in the Islamic conception, God is not all loving. His love is partial and has to be earned. The Muslim God loves only those who first love him. His love thus rises no higher than the love that Jesus said even tax collectors and sinners exhibit. And in his website, Shabir Ali admits this. In dealing with the question, if God is loving, kind, and merciful, why would he punish one in hell? Listen to what he says in response to that question. Due to a misunderstanding, many people see this as an irresolvable contradiction. The misunderstanding begins with the assumption that God loves everyone, even sinners. It then becomes difficult to explain why God would punish sinners. He says, uh, to quote from Matthew's Gospel, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. He says, Now this passage indicates it is a good thing to love one's enemies. It follows then that God, being infinitely good, must love his enemies too. But then why would he punish them? The Quran resolves this problem by indicating quite clearly that God does not love sinners who refuse to change. He then goes on to list the people whom God does love, and he concludes with a prayer that we might become deserving of God's love. Now, don't you think that this is an inadequate conception of God? What would you think of a parent who said to his children, if you measure up to my standards and do as I say, then I will love you. Some of you have had parents like that, and who didn't love you unconditionally, and you know the emotional scars you bear as a result. As the greatest conceivable being, the most perfect being, the source of all goodness and love, God's love must be unconditional and impartial. Of course God loves those whom his justice demands that he punish. Therefore, the Islamic conception of God seems to me to be morally deficient. I cannot, therefore, rationally accept it. Thank you, Dr. I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, Mr. Shabir Ali, who also has 18 minutes uh, equally for his opening remarks.